So, um, Colm and I were just upstairs uh, getting ready for this event, and um, I don't know what other writers talk about when they're alone together preparing for events, probably deep, profound things, what they're working on and what they're reading. But we were, we were comparing our visas, <laughs> sort of immigrant nerds. And I, I was reminded of... Who has of, the biggest visa? <laughs> I was reminded of... I, I just returned uh, to New York from a couple of months in Ireland. Um, and when I was coming through the airport in January, at the end of January, rather, not just... Uh, the, the immigration officer, I'm always terrified of them, because I just think you know, they're going to lock me up. Um, said, what do you do? What are you going, what are you going over to, to New York for? What, what's your, what do you do? And I said, I'm a writer, and um, what do you write? Fiction. You know Colm Tobin? I said, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, and I, I said, you must see a lot of him. Oh, yeah, he's, he's, well, he's through back and forth here all the time. And I, I said to Colm, you know, when the immigration officers are boasting about seeing you, you really know you've made it. <laughs> It used to be bars, it used to be he went into a bar that said he was here the other day, but now it's the immigration officer. <laughs> Funny the way things change. <laughs> but how do you, I mean, the travel back and forth, and not just travel back and forth, because we both, in our both bio, of our biographies there, I noticed that you know, live between New York and Ireland, in, in, in both cases. Um, and I'd like some advice, please, on how to uh, to write while you're moving between two places. And in your case, you you travel a lot, but you write all the time, don't you? Yeah, I think that you can write short stories anywhere, and then it's harder to write a novel. And so that's great because um, you can just postpone writing novels. <laughs> um, and uh, the um, every year when I come, I've been for the last six years, I think I've been coming to the United States for one semester. And what's very odd is the difference between the dream world of the United States and the reality. And what, what I mean is that you arrive and it's exciting, but then you're suddenly without all of your props. And it's odd how simple those props are, and not having them then is so strange. I mean simple matters like the radio you listen to in the morning usually, or the sounds, or you know, just the whole business of venturing out into the day being a challenge here. Whereas in Ireland, just shuffling across the road is just fine. I mean, cars, anyway, cars go on the wrong side of the road here. Um, and uh, so eventually what happens to me is that something happens, occurs to me, and I write it down. And it's, so there are about, I think, maybe 10, maybe eight or 10 short stories that have arisen from that business of being in rented accommodation at my age for a season and suddenly after a month or two starting to work and the images that come are darker, more melancholy, more, more extreme than they would be I think if I was at home. Um, and uh, then what I'm also doing is I'm dreaming of the novel and I'm, I know when May comes this year I'm, I'm back in the business of the long stretch into finishing the book which I'm not going to do while I'm here, but while I'm here, there are probably two stories, but I least expect them will come, and they'll get darker and weirder the more I go on. I mean, what do you do? Oh, I'm still finding out what I do. Uh, well, as I said, I just I spent six months, actually, in Ireland at the end of last year, pretty much, um, and I, I sort of, I, I ended up doing something that at first um, seemed like, seemed funny, but then it became sort of ridiculous. Uh, I lived in re a rented house in County Leitrim, which was essentially in a ghost estate. You know, one of those estates that's unfinished um, because the rent was cheap and it was close to places I needed to be. And uh, at first it seemed like an interest, in July it seemed interesting. By November it seemed absolutely ridiculous. And I found myself writing out of that and I wrote a short radio play which was set in a ghost estate in County Leitrim, it wasn't a very big leap of imagination. <laughs> but none of the, none of none of the um, nothing about being home in Ireland during that time was in any way comforting or familiar. And that was so. There was more, it was a much um, much darker piece than anything I've written here in in New York. And I've written a little bit out of living in Brooklyn. I've written stories, especially in the novel that I'm working on at the moment, is set between Brooklyn and Ireland. Um, but I, I never really trust the 
it takes me a while to trust a, a piece of fiction or a piece of drama that comes from living here in, in the United States, where I've lived for six and a half years now. Um, I'm always when, when I when I start a piece of fiction and I realise that it's going to be set here, I always think, am I just grabbing onto the nearest thing? Is it not coming from the same deep place as? For example, my novel Solace came from, which is the worlds of experience that were known absolutely innately to me between the Irish Midlands and Dublin. And so there's always a, there's always a period of feeling extremely nervous about material that comes from, from the States. I, I can't really write about a place unless I've lost it. You know, in other words, I wish they would, that nice man, he's, they're all very nice, those guys, the immigration, would just say to me sometimes, you're never going to get into America again, you know, you've done something so awful. <laughs> And then I would have lost New York. And then I would suddenly be able to get a New York novel where I would, the only way I would be able to get it back would be by writing it. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm the same about Dublin. I mean, I've lived in Dublin for a long time, but I've never really written about it because it's never been taken away from me. But with Barcelona, where, you know, I lived there for three years, from 20, age of 20 to 23, and then I had to go home. And so for all those years at home, I dreamt about it and thought about it. And I never really got it back again, even though I started to go back there. That, the atmosphere of those years, never came back to me. And also, the town I'm from, in Escorthy, even though in Ireland, even though I go back there, it's not like that anymore. And so those two lost places, Barcelona um, and, and in Escorthy, and to some extent the Catalan um, Pyrenees, and a few other places, but if I'm if I'm living in a place and if I feel I can go to it regularly, then it sort of means nothing to me. It, it probably I probably like it and you know get on with it and cross the street and you know it's all fine. But unless it's lost for fiction, for me it's no use. So there has to be a sort of grieving involved. <laughs> grieving is maybe a bit strong. Maybe just missing not having and not being there, and so it can only enter your dreams, and it starts to... It, I think grieving might be a bit strong. Just moaning. Oh, oh, whining. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a different person when you're in Enniscorthy, where you grew up? When you go back there, um, how do you behave? Uh, I mean, you'll see people all the time who are linked to your family and who are very much... Were part, may not have been part of the landscape of your childhood, but people who know you in a way that those in Dublin and New York don't. Yeah, I have a house in Wexford, and um, on the first night when I moved into it, or the, the next day, I thought I should visit, you know, the few neighbours. And, uh, you know, eventually I was, I, I, anyway, I knocked on a door and I went in and I was sitting for a while, and then the, the woman went out and, and her mother came in and we talked for a while, and she eventually said to me, you know, I don't think you know who I am. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I said, no, I, I just came in just to say hello because I'm next door. You know, she said, I'm Peggy Gallagher. I said, you're Peggy Gallagher. And of course, for, you know, I would have been left as a baby with Peggy Gallagher when she was a teenager. I would have, when I was three or four, would want to go and play with Peggy Gallagher, who was, say, 15 or 16. I probably hadn't seen her in all the years. So all of that, yeah, all of that business. And the funny thing that happens, um, I was in Egypt and I met these nice English people and they were terribly grand and uh, I stayed with them when I was going through London and uh, they had a maid but unfortunately the maid was from near where I'm from and so the maid appeared and somebody said so where are you from? I said, I'm in a Scorthy. Oh what part? And we started to talk and I had the whole breathy business of talking of Wexford <laughs> idiom and all oh, right so you're one of them oh you're oh you're uncle oh, you're, oh, and eventually over dinner they said to me do you know that um, what happened when you know when Molly came in and I said no you know that you, you changed completely. I mean, your accent changed, your face changed, you know, everything about you changed. Do you do that all the time? <laughs> and, and I said, do you never do that? And they said, no, no, we, we, we would never do that. <laughs> and, and then I, I, I almost wanted to say to them that, oh yeah, well, that's the difference between you and me. I'm stereo and you're mono. <laughs> but, but I wonder, does that happen to you? I mean, that, that, look, it, it has to happen to you. And in fact, the book Solace, in a way, deals with that because when um, the texts start to come from home, and home here is a farm in County Longford, our hero 
is in various bars in Dawson Street in Dublin. Now, I wouldn't even venture into them, they're so trendy. <laughs> I mean, there were people like your hero who are not doing their thesis in Trinity College sit and talk existentialism. And they, you know, they talk about Jack Derrida and things like that. And um, so he's sitting talking Jack Derrida. And the text comes because his farmer, the farmer, his father, has learned how to text. And so that difference, that road, your road, which is, which is very significant in the book, it takes up a lot of space in the book in a way, the road between Dawson Street and um, Longford, mm -hmm. it, it isn't just, a, 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 I mean, it's a road between two different people who are buried within the same individual in the book, isn't that? So the drama, the drama in the book is as much the drama within the hero as it is the drama that's going on within the family. Isn't that right? Um, this morning, um, I got a text from a friend of mine, a writer called Kevin Barry, um, uh -huh. who's a brilliant writer. His first novel is coming out here in June. Um, and uh, back in Ireland, while I was there over um, the winter, I did, an, I did a couple of interviews, but one of them was with a magazine or a, a newspaper called The Farmer's Journal. And they have, you know, it's what it sounds like. It's a weekly magazine, weekly newspaper for, for farmers, telling you the prices the cattle got at the marks and what, where to buy a tractor. And I don't know, I, did, I actually don't really read it, but... Uh, I read it I just imagine. for the personal ad. The personal ads are great. <laughs> There's a magazine with the Farmer's Journal every week, which is aimed, essentially, at the, the women. And um, so they interviewed me, and they put my picture on the cover this week, which I found out by... I got a text this morning from Kevin Barry, and he said, Cover a girl for the Farmer's Journal. Don't think that class of thing is going to slip by me unnoticed. <laughs> um, and it was sort of like, oh, I thought I could keep those worlds. No, I, don't, I don't really, I mean, from when I had my book launch in Dublin, when the book was, was published in, in Ireland in August, um, it was a room full of, um, it was a sort of like my wedding, actually, in a way that everybody, people from every single uh, part of your life are there. And I went into, you know, like I do, you get into a bit of panic when the, when the, the, uh, the parts of your life are in one place. And I didn't really know which accent to use, actually. <laughs> so I ended up using a merge that nobody understood. 